morning, everyone. How are we doing tonight? I'm just so excited. I, I really am. This is a, this is a very special film. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Gary Baxter. I'm on staff here at the church. And this film, Nefarious, uh, just blew me away when I went to go see it. We actually took a group from our young adult ministry to go watch it. And after viewing it, we could not stop talking about it. It educated us. It gave us a different perspective on spiritual warfare, something that we so desperately need in this time. And so it was interesting because Jim Caviezel was actually sitting in front of us in the theater. It was his third time to go watch this film because he was so fascinated by the different concepts that the filmmaker, the, uh, Steve Deese, who is the writer of the book, and it's, it's, it's really, I mean, obviously a lot of us have read Screw Tape Letters, which is, it's a, it's a powerful film. But the reason why I think this is so unique is because Steve's approach to writing this book, it was catering towards American culture. And I think that right now the enemy is just getting so bold in our society and we have to be able to recognize and have that level of discernment to be able to call it out when we see it. A lot of people were fearful uh, tonight putting this on. You know, the Bible talks about it 365 times in the Bible. It talks about do not, do not fear. And so I think it's important for us to be bold. I think it was very important for us to do this screening, to have the opportunity to be able to partner with Turning Point Faith for uh, free, uh, Hollywood for Freedom, which is an amazing organization that stands up against the mandates in Hollywood. Uh, a lot of evil going on there. But I think that the pendulum is swinging. I think that really there's a lot of Christians that are taking back ground in Hollywood. And we really need to take back ground because it is the most powerful creative medium that we have. You know, Jesus sent down the best storyteller of all time. He was... He was relating to the culture through his parables, right? And so I think that in Hollywood, as I'm in, I'm in the film industry as well, if you guys don't know, I've been in the film industry for 13 years. I was an actor, and I went to Loyola Marymount Film School, and, and I'm a producer, and I work here at the church. Uh, but I think God is doing something very special. I was talking to the lead producer, Chris, and, uh, and we were just talking about the importance of taking background. I think this is such an important film. So we're really stoked. As a church, we go through the anchored in the reading, and right now we're getting into Judges. And in Judges chapter 7, verses 9 through 11, the Lord tells Gideon to go into the enemy's camp and to hear what they have to say. And that his hands would be strengthened through this process. And so I think that us doing this, guys, we're going to be strengthened. Uh, our eyes are going to be opened, and we're going to be able to get just a new form of, of, of perspectives and tools that we so desperately need, okay? But before I get into this, uh, guys, I'm going to read a passage from Ephesians uh, chapter 6, talking about the armor of God here. He's going to put it up behind me. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with the truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shed your feet with the preparations of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Guys, this is so important that we equip ourselves with the armor of God each and every day. We're all Christians. If you're Christian, you are enlisted into this battle. This is a spiritual war that we are in. The enemy is getting bolder and bolder every single day. And so I'm so grateful for what the Lord is going to do tonight. And uh, guys, I'm going to pray and then we're going to get into the film, okay? <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this evening, Lord, this event for you orchestrating your servants, Lord, to be able to come tonight, Lord, to be able to speak boldly, to be able to give insights on how we can be equipped 
so we can recognize how the enemy operates. So that way we cannot be on defense, but Lord, we want to be on offense. We want to take back ground in your son's name, Jesus Christ. And we want to call out evil and the schemes of the enemy when they see it, Lord. We want to realign others on the path that can glorify you, Lord. We want to operate within your will and your calling for our life, Lord. Thank you for what you are doing within Hollywood. There's a lot of darkness, but Lord, we are taking background, and I thank you for that. I ask that you can continue to rise up bold Spartans that can utilize that medium to be able to be a road sign for Jesus Christ, Lord. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. All right, guys, so we're super blessed. We have the writer of the book, Steve Deese. So the book, yeah, he's in the house. What an incredible mind, uh, just, and what an amazing soldier that we have for us and what he he did with that book. The book, uh, this film was a precursor to the book, and so we not only have Steve, but we also have Chris, the lead producer of the film, and uh, we also have the, the lead actor, Jordan. So you guys want to come on up, and we're going to do a QA. and a You can sit right here. Great work. Yeah, I mean, even watching it uh, a second time, it's just, it's, unbelievable how powerful it is, new perspective, seeing it another time, and I guess I'll just start off. Uh, Steve, I'm so curious on how this all started, and, um, you know, can you kind of explain to us where you got the idea? Have you always been drawn to this this theme of spiritual warfare? Um, before I became a Christian, my uh, my grandmother, who used to babysit me a lot, she was really into horror movies and uh, the occult. God bless her. And, uh, like, I remember uh, she used to get me uh, doped up on Archway sugar cookies when my mom and my stepdad used to leave her, leave me with her. And, like, I remember as a little kid, we were watching uh, the original Salem's Lot miniseries. And the scene where the, the lead vampire comes up through the uh, floor in that miniseries. I don't think I slept for like a week, you know? Mm. And, and the, but, but by the time I was like 12, I was pretty much over all this because I'd mm. seen it all. So I've always been fascinated with the subject matter, and then I got even more fascinated with it when I saw the, uh, the other side of the equation and really the fullness of what we mean uh, by, you know, the unseen realm or mm. spiritual warfare after becoming a Christian. Mm. And um, t- today's actually the 10-year anniversary. My wife told me this. T- today's actually the 10-year anniversary of when I signed my, uh, my first book deal. And so I went to Washington, D.C. to promote that book. And I'm in the shower getting ready to go do some publicity. And this voice it just kind of pops into my head. And it says, this book is dedicated to all the useful idiots out there, especially those of you who had no idea you were being used all this time, for you proved to be the most useful idiots of them all, nefarious. And if you buy the book today, that's the actual opening dedication of the book. And I remember thinking, that's just kind of a weird thing to have pop in your head, you know, all, this, all of a sudden. And so I got back to my hotel room that night, and I started playing around with it, and I came up with the idea of what if we, you know, because I've published one book, so apparently I'm qualified now to write sequels to C.S. Lewis works, you know. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, Barack Obama published two memoirs before he's 40, so dare to dream, right? The audacity of hope, right? Yeah. And uh, I thought, what if, we, what if we took Lewis's premise, but since it's a sequel, the threat's got to be bigger, right? Those are the rules, right? Mm. And so instead of the temptation of us as individuals, what about the takedown of an entire culture? And, uh, of course, there's no better place to get inspired about a demonic takeover of America than Washington, D.C., right? Inspiration <laughs> abounds. And, uh, and, and so I started playing around with it. I wrote the introduction uh, that night in the room, and I called a couple of pastor buddies of mine, um, and I said, hey, I just want to read something to you. And I don't want here. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm just going to read something to you. And when I'm done, give me your reaction. And they were both blown away by what I read them. And so for the next several months, it's the, it's the longest it's ever taken me to write a book. And I've written eight. Um, and it's because I, I just, I was not comfortable with how comfortable I was getting into the shoes of this character. You know, the whole thing, when you dance with the devil, the devil don't change, changes you, right? And so weeks and months would go by, and I'd put the character on the shelf, 
and 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 because I just didn't want to get into that realm again. And I got to the end, and I struggled with how to end the book. Finally, my wife, who's sitting over there tonight, finally looked at me and said, "Is the book written by a demon or not?" And I said, "Yeah," because I don't like nihilistic endings. There's got to be some redemptive ending, you know. Mm. And uh, and she's like, "Well, if it's written by a demon, I mean, he's just going to, you know, spike the ball in the end zone and move on." And so the final words of the book are, Mene, Mene, Tequila, Parson, from Daniel. You've been weighed, measured, and found wanting. And, uh, and those are the final words that uh, he speaks as himself in the movie. And then uh, in terms of how the movie got made, the guy at the end, this is his fault. Uh, he, he heard me, I believe Chris, you know the story better than me, right? You were listening to Glenn Beck, and I was on there that day, right? Yeah, I, I tuned into Glenn Beck uh, many years ago, and... And this guy comes on on the radio for a segment to promote this book and for five minutes just rips it up. Just tear, I'm like, who is this guy? That was amazing. So I looked him up, looked up the book, bought the book, started reading it. I walked into my coworker's office and I said, you guys got to hear this. I get two paragraphs in and they're like, we want it. So, um, uh, it, yeah, so it was, that's how we found it. And then uh, we reached out to Steve and we was happily ever after. <laughs> I'm impressed because, it, you know, I know me and a, and a lot of other people that have watched it, you walk away from that thinking that that was the most theologically sound film on spiritual warfare, possession, all of these things. Now, were you, when you were crafting this book, I mean, were you consulting with theologians to make sure that everything was aligned? Uh, you know, how was your process on making sure everything was theologically sound? On the book side, and Chris can speak more on the movie side of, yeah. of how they looked at that, on the... On the book side, the, the book, you know, after my conversion, I, I mean, I spent the next several years, I, I read everything I could read, I watched everything I could possibly watch, uh, I watched like every show, like on all the Christian television networks on Drake TV, and I'm, frankly, I'm not sure I'd recommend you do that. Um, <laughs> I finally cleansed my brain of about a third of them, but, uh, but I needed to know, I wanted to know what's real, what's true, where are these, what are these varying traditions, I mean, I studied... Catholicism, I studied the Reformation, I studied uh, the period between the Testaments, the Maccabees, and all, and church history, and I just, I wanted to put this all into, into context, and, um, and, and, and then, of course, ultimately, the Bible is the fulcrum, that's the plumb line, and I, and I juxtaposed it with all of that, and the book really was the culmination of, uh, everything that's in that book is the culmination of several years of theological training I just took up on my own. I just took up in men, the men's the group that I was in. Mm. Uh, and, and just, you know, just kind of my obsession to know what's real and what's true and what's not. Yeah, well, you did a phenomenal job with it. And, you know, Jordan, I'm curious, you know, you've been in, in the industry for a long time. I was looking at your eye to be in the back there, and you've been on Entourage and Grey's Anatomy, all these big shows. What, how is this film different than every other project that you have worked on? Um, <laughs> I, where do you, first off, thank you guys for being here. Um, it's an honor uh, to be here and, and um, for all you guys to be here to share in the movie. So thank you um, for having me and, and us. Um, it's different and profound for a multitude of reasons. Um, I'll start with, uh, just from a performance side, I mean, these kinds of movies that are essentially a, w what's called a two-hander, a two-character movie, are almost non-existent. Mm. Um, they don't make movies like this anymore. So as an actor, as a performer, I mean, something like this comes your way. It, it doesn't come around every day. So just from that perspective, that kind of delicious, complex, rich material that as an actor you get to sink into and go tete-a-tete -tete with another actor, uh, that's special just, just for that. Mm -hmm. um, the material is complex, it, it's multi-layered, it's operating on multiple levels. There's, there's obviously the, the pure literal level of the kind of investigation that I'm going through, is he or isn't he, or the, the three options, which is, is he sane, is he crazy, or is there an even scarier option, which is he's telling the truth? I mean, all that is happening. I'm trying to figure that out, but there's obviously the bigger allegory, the bigger profound stuff, the spiritual warfare that's going on simultaneously. And so you get to sink into that material. And so on top of that, 
just by the nature of how we shot the movie, Sean and I didn't have any rehearsal. Really? Um, which for a piece like this, you you know, which is play like, you'd you'd love to get in there, rehearse for a couple of weeks, make discoveries, get in on its feet, and then go shoot it. But uh, there were a lot of things that that compressed the time schedule, um, but we didn't have that opportunity. So Sean and I had to just dive into this. We hadn't met before, we didn't know each other before, and we didn't get a lot of time to to work the material. Um, and so that's my wife and little boy just showing up. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and so. Uh, with, with, with a situation like that, you have to, who, who, who you're acting opposite, who's on the other side of the table, is everything. Um, you have to have trust, you have to have chemistry, you have to have a connection to make this material sing. And everything is kind of dependent upon whether you've got that chemistry. Yeah. And fortunately, Sean and I just clicked mm. and, uh, and found it and surprised each other. Mm. Um, because you have to have somebody opposite you that is working at a level, performance-wise, that can elicit reactions out of you to surprise even yourself um, and to, to, to find that authenticity. And so he didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know what he was going to do, and, and we found it. Yeah, the chemistry was profound. Uh, you know, you guys really, in your reaction shots to him, the scene that stuck out to me and was my favorite was that abortion sequence. Uh, it was just, it was so powerful. And your arc just in that scene was unbelievable. Why do you think that, you know, that's a very important sequence. I mean, maybe for you being the producer, Chris, uh, you know, why was that such an important sequence to make sure you guys nailed in the film? I know, you know, the, the filmmakers you guys did Unplanned before this, and so you guys are boldly pro-life. I don't see that in a lot of films. You do that automatically, you know, Rotten Tomatoes is gonna just annihilate you. So. You guys decided to stand firm and, and do it. And, uh, you know, why was that scene so important for the film, Chris? I think it's the, the movie's most powerful scene. And, uh, it, you know, the Nefarious will use truth or, and he will use lies to beat up on James and get what he wants. And so in this case, he's really taking it to him and just grinding it. And he's, he'll take the truth of the matter and he'll use it against him. And in this case, he takes the thing that is so close to him, so vulnerable for mm -hmm. him, and just lays it bare. And even takes it into history and takes it, I mean, it, he just rips him. And even in the fact that, like, it's happening in that moment mm. and, and, and showing that this is actually the delight of hell. Mm. And from their side, showing the perspective from their side. And like he says, the creator creates and we destroy and we do all of it through you. That's what we do together, you and us, we destroy. And you see the demonic behind the humanity on these situations. And I, I think it's, it's, it, it's hugely profound and it's a turning point for James. And it's, it was so important that we got that scene right and it's really at the midpoint of the movie. And so it serves a, a, a lot of purposes all at the same time. And I think both of you and Sean just pulled it off masterfully it's it's a haunting scene oh yeah it's it's haunting and it and it even i find it surprising how haunting it is the way chuck and carrie who directed the film and uh and wrote the film the way they constructed it james james thinks he knows everything right james james is smart james is accomplished um but james isn't wise and um, he's got an answer for everything until Nefarious keeps chipping away and chipping away and chipping away to the point where James is almost even questioning his own sanity, but, but also questioning everything he thought he knew. Um, and that is one of the significant um, inflection points in that trajectory because James going from thinking he knows everything essentially is in a position where he's, he's playing God, right? In every, in every one, every three of those, mm. both with his mother, ultimately with, with his girlfriend and their unborn child, and then ultimately in the, in the decision to certify him fit to stand execution. Mm. Um, 
And so it's, it's, a, it's a significant moment. Can I, I could just add to, I'll just share with you guys, uh, I, I don't know how, how many of you have known around the things going around in the film, but um, on, a, on a personal note, um, it's just kind of a miraculous thing the way this all unfolded, but it's one of the reasons that this whole experience was one of the most profound of my life, which is um, my son, my firstborn son, who's sitting over there, was born on day one of shooting this movie. Wow. Um, and so, yeah, <laughs> that little guy. Let's go. Um, yeah. And so, uh, that experience and the depth and profundity of becoming a father and, and all of that is inextricably interwoven with this movie and my experience making the movie. And I think, just from my perspective, consciously or unconsciously, is in me during the making of the movie and, and certainly that, that scene. Mm. How did it impact your faith personally? You know, diving into this as an actor, you know, and I can, I can relate to it when you read a script that's so profound and you're living in that character and you're going so deep, you know, it really does have an effect on your, on your psyche, but, but this is so special, so it had to have had some sort of, you know, I, I would assume it would have a big effect on your faith as well. Did it? <laughs> um, yes, the simple answer is yes. Mm. Um, we were joking just even tonight about uh, um, the number of, of coincidences that... Um, Probably just a coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but at, that surround this movie and the making of the movie and all of our lives in connection with this movie. And at a certain point, I'll, I'll just share with you just a personal one along the, the same lines as the story I was just telling you. My, my son's name is Rocky, by the way. Um, and um, this, this little part of that story is just that this, this movie came to me I, I can't even explain how it came to me. You know, I, I didn't know Chuck and Kara. I didn't know Chris. I, I didn't know Steve. I didn't know any of them. But it, mm. it came to me. I don't even know the story of how you guys came to me. But um, the script was sent to me. I read it. I knew it was going to be special. And I knew it was something that I probably wanted to do. But my wife, Rochelle, was, was nine and a half months pregnant. Mm. And, I, and I knew that if, if I took the movie that I was most, we live here, the movie was shooting in Oklahoma City, and I knew if I took the movie, it was almost guaranteed that I wouldn't be there for, for, the, for the birth of my, my first child. Um, and so it was a moment that I had to make a decision. And um, we came to that decision together as a family and realized it was, it was important and what was best and, and best for our family. And so I, I went to Oklahoma City and I got there on a Sunday and uh, Rocky was born on that Wednesday. But I got there on that Sunday to a city I've never been to and, and a hotel that I didn't choose. <laughs> and uh, but it's, it's important to the story. Um, and so I got there on that Sunday night and I, I went up to the room and I closed the door and I stood there and I was alone. And, uh, and, and my pregnant wife was 2,000 miles away and I was standing there, and it was quiet, and I was alone, and I just said to myself, like, what, what, what am I doing? Like, what, am I, what am I doing here? Um, am I supposed to, like, this is, is this the right thing to do? So I, I just said, you know what, I'm just going to go for a walk. And I put my stuff down, and I, um, I walked out of the hotel. I turned right. I walked about a block, and I, I looked up. And there was a gigantic sign that said Rocky. <laughs> we had already named him. I I've never seen a sign that says Rocky before. <laughs> I mean, a, liter a literal, obviously the figurative, metaphorical dimension of it is obvious, but the literal sign. And I thought, oh, okay, okay, uh, it's, it's, it's okay. Then I go to set, and our stunt coordinator on the movie was Sylvester Stallone's stunt double for like 20 years. Did all the Rocky movies. It's impossible, like it's impossible that that would be the case. And I just thought, it's okay, it's okay. It's, it's, I, I'm where I'm supposed to be. Um, and so enough of those, even like little moments happen. You, you can't help but go, okay. That's amazing. 
Yeah. So you, you saw God's hand, and then I know I've heard stories about the other side of it, and you guys just dealing with a lot of the enemy attacks. You guys want to briefly just go over some of the attacks that went down? I mean, I know we've all heard about what happened to Jim, Passion of the Christ, and, and that uh, it wasn't until this film that I've heard of such strong demonic activity uh, trying to take you guys out and prevent this film from getting made. So what happened? Well, I remember when we first began uh, the film, and I, I sent everybody at Believe a link uh, to the making uh, of The Omen and uh, the making of The Exorcist on YouTube. And I said, y'all better watch this because this is what's probably coming our way. Mm. And you kind of think that's tongue in cheek or you're sort of aware of what you're doing, but you don't really know until you go through it yourselves. You know, I mean, I'll just, I mean, there's a lot of stories, but I'll just take you to the week of release. All right. So we come back from uh, the, the premiere of the film in Dallas, and it was a tremendously successful event. We're all just really excited. And um, I have like this odd, like rash right next to my armpit, you know, and I'm thinking, I don't know, man, I, I, don't, I do the whole Jesse Ventura, I ain't got time to bleed thing. I'll worry about this later. I'm kind of busy, you know, and, and my wife's got bone spurs in her knee. And so I've got to take her to have that taken care of. And I'll deal with that later. And as another 24, 48 hours go by, I'm like in excruciating pain. And I finally wake up that, uh, that second night. In the middle of the night, I cannot sleep. I mean, it's excruciating pain. She finally uh, takes me to the hospital later that day because I won't go on my own. And um, I have a MRSA infection. Mm. And it's very, yeah, the, everybody, in, yeah, it's extremely rare. It was, the doctor said it, if it, it was of unknown cause and origin, all right, is what I was told. And it was beyond painful. I mean, they literally had to carve. By the time she finally got me to go to the hospital two days later, basically there was a grove of these MRSA cysts in here, next, uh, here in my upper body. They literally had to carve them out of me. Uh, and, and then I went back to, and that of course tickled. And then I went back to the doc, my doctor the next day. And now that the original large ones that they saw were gone, he noticed that there were others that had been missed. And so now I've got it. He's now got to now remove them as well. And then he looks at me and says, this is the most painful thing we do without putting people under these days. Mm. I was like, well, that's, can we alter that? Can we make an exception now? You know, <laughs> you know? and so um, I had, then I had to go back to the hospital again because there's only like one grade of antibiotic on planet earth that defeats this. And most people can't take it orally because it's such um, highly, um, you know, active and you have allergic reactions. So a few days go by and it's working well. And so they think I'm one of the rare people that can tolerate it. Well, what happened is after the medication got rid of the cysts, it then turned on my immune system. And for the next three days, I had 104 degree fevers constantly. I'm back in the hospital again, now halfway across the country because I went on a speaking engagement because we thought I was better. And, and so I get out of the hospital. They finally figure out it's not that the MRSA was in my bloodstream, but it's an allergic reaction. I get out of the hospital. We go back to our hotel room. We're trying to figure out how we're going to get home. Chris texts me that day and says, you guys aren't going to believe this. I was putting, well, you can tell. It's your story. You tell the story, Chris. Yeah, so the night before, the, I'm getting texts and everything. Please pray for Steve. This is looking really, really bad. Like, hearing the concern and the texts and the phone calls and stuff. And so that, that was the night before. The next day, I actually was at a park with this man and, and his family, lovely wife and kid. And we just said goodbye. 60 seconds later, we, had, we were doing street parking. I was putting my three-year-old in his car seat. And bam, full speed, 40 miles an hour, this car hits our parked car. And this is like street parking, but it's like, like designated off. It's not like it's in the road, but it's on a busy road in Los Feliz. And 40 miles an hour hits the car that was leaning against my back. Like I was leaning inside the car to put him in his car seat. And hits the car, rips the car to the other side, to like the driver's side car, and you know, it's just smack, totals the car, totals our parked car. Gets out, of course, she blames us for it, you know. <laughs> I don't know, what did we, I'm sorry, our parked car got in your way. But, uh, and the thing is, 
the, uh, I was done putting him in his car seat, and just at the last second, he kicked my hand. And so I leaned back in, and I did, you know, tugged a couple times on to make sure, and that's when she hit the car. If he didn't kick my hand, I would have stepped backward, mm-hmm. and there would have been nowhere for my entire body to go except between a Porsche SUV going 40 miles an hour and that door, and I just would have turned to mush. Then the, then the next day, one of our other producers, John Sullivan, sends us a text. Guys, you aren't going to believe this. I believe this was at his house, right? Right. So his, yeah. Yeah, his, it was three days later, but it was within five days, four or five days. He almost dies. I almost die. And then John's car, who's the marketing director for us and a good friend, he said, you won't believe this. My car just got totaled. It was parked in front of his house. And it got totaled even worse than my car got totaled. The, the, the number... I don't the enemy's just out guys. here buying new cars for our entire crew, <laughs> basically. Okay, but this is really encouraging being a yes, Christian filmmaker yeah, so so for me. Yeah. And know what I'm getting into? Go and do likewise. <laughs> that's that's brutal. Uh, no, but I was actually just if I do. I, it was really cool. So obviously that day, I mean, it's uh, the first time I almost got killed, uh, and it was a miracle. It was a miracle that I, I survived it, and. I would go, we go home and we're processing this out, right? Because we're with my little boy, he's three years old, and we say, are, are, are you scared? Does your heart hurt? You know, and he's like, I'm scared. And he doesn't usually, so we're, we're praying with him and just processing the trauma. We're crying because it's, you know, my, I don't want to cry. Hmm. But I end up calling my parents, and uh, my mom, two weeks earlier, like one week earlier, we had visited them up north in, in the Bay Area, and she had shared this prophetic word that she had gotten about divine protection over her family. And I didn't hear that part when she shared it just one week earlier. And she said, let me share this with you again. And she shared it, and it, he specifically promised my mom divine protection for her kids. Wow. Yeah. Praise the Lord, man. Steve, I, re- I read the book, and uh, I encourage you guys, read the book, download it, go to Audible, get it. Uh, I-, I listened to it this week, and I mean, it, it doesn't really, I know everybody's talking about Screwtape Letters, but when I read your book, it, was, it hit me so much harder because you're really honing in on American culture. Uh, I know us at Godspeak, we faced uh, just, you know, the, the tyranny, the mandates, all of these things that we're all struggling with. And in terms of, you know, you talk a lot about how the enemy wants us to be comfortable. The enemy doesn't want us to challenge corruption. The enemy doesn't want us to to stand up to the government when they start to cross the lines. And so how can you speak about the, you know, a lot of people are saying, hey, you can't talk about politics from the pulpit. You can't contend on these certain political issues. And, and so what's your comment on that and how the enemy is involved in preventing pastors from standing firm and contending in the public square? I wrote the book very subversively. Uh, when you read the book, the first 50 to 100 pages, he will draw you in. Um, you'll view him as so, sort of an, a Bullworth anti-hero that maybe you don't approve of his methods, but you're like, well, you know, he kind of inadvertently, you know, hits on the right points and you're sympathetic. Mm. And then when he sinks his claws into you and you're trapped, that's when the true darkness comes out. And as the book goes on and on, and you notice this going through it, it gets darker and darker Mm. and darker until it basically is, it's pitch black at the very end. And I, I, I wanted to use that approach because comfort is killing us. Mm -hmm. We are, we are way too comfortable and hey, man, I, I say that knowing full well that it is 35 days until the most wonderful time of the year, the college football season begins, all right? <laughs> I, mean, I, 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 I mean, I love my man cave. My son was texting me, you know, about the next game him and I are going to go through together on the PS5 when I get home. I, I, I love the accoutrements of being an American as much as anybody. I am an ugly American. I saw Del Taco. I used to eat there when I was a little kid when I lived out here, you know. I'd rather eat Taco Bell and Del Taco than, than actual Mexican food. I don't want to live anywhere. <laughs> I don't want to live anywhere where a pizza delivery driver cannot fear at least remotely that he will be robbed, all right. I am an ugly American. But understand, though, you know, to everything there is a time and a season. 
And, and there are seasons when we have to be willing to set some of those comforts aside to secure them for future generations. Yeah. And we are in one of those seasons right now. Yeah. Amen. And one of the things I love that we did in this film, and, you know, I, I think the best horror film that has been made so far this century is a movie called Hereditary. And if you see, if, when you saw that film in the theater, it is un, the word I would use to describe it is unsettling. Sounds and stuff are going off that'll make you turn around. You're not sure they're part of the movie or not. You're never really settled in. You're, it, it, it is subversive. You think it is about one thing. And then there is a death that happens early in the film, and suddenly you're like, that is not where I thought this was going to go. And you're on edge the rest of the time. I think we emulated some of that in our movie. And the abortion scene, I think, is you get through this movie and you think, okay, this is kind of like one of those 90s Silence of the Lambs, primal fear, psychological thrillers. Is he crazy or is he not? Okay. And then, and so just when you think maybe that trope is played out, the true worldview of the movie comes out about 30 plus minutes into the movie. And by now you're pot committed. So if you walk into the theater and you hate what we believe, chances are you're probably not walking out because mm -hmm. you already spent your money. And that's what Hollywood has done to us for decades. Yeah. It has shown that it will allow, uh, we have shown them we will, th that we will let them invade our worldview mm. with things that we know are an affront to it mm. if we are entertained or interested in the characters. And we tried to emulate that with this movie. And so this movie is subversive, right? You kind of think that, you know, well, I don't know. And then all of a sudden it smacks you right in the throat. And from that scene on, the movie is pedal to the metal. Mm. And the movie is, a, is, is, a, is an hour and 40 minute long provoking. It provokes unbelievers. James is the stand-in, you know. Are you sure you really know the, tr the origin of your worldview, that you're really as smart as you, think it, as you think you are? But it provokes us as well. The line when Nefarious says, that's why you're losing, mm -hmm. that is aimed right straight at all of us, yeah. right? You know, do we know what time it is? Yeah. And so I, I think we have to get back to recognizing that Christianity historically has been a subversive religion. It subverts cultures. It doesn't accommodate them. It subverts empires. It doesn't succumb to them. It subverts political systems. It doesn't meld with them, right? And I think that we've got to get used to doing that again. Otherwise, the salt has lost its savor, mm. and it will be thrown out because it's of no use to anybody, so it will be trampled underfoot. Mm, that's good. This is a weird question. I don't know if you've got it, but I'm wondering, Steve, if you've ever considered writing a book from the opposite perspective, from the angel's perspective, have you considered that? And uh, if so, Chris, would you make the movie on it? <laughs> I, I sort of feel like that's been done a lot. Um, I mean, Milton did it centuries ago. Um, Randy Alcorn wrote a book a few, uh, about 20 years ago called Lord Falgren's Letters that is criminally underappreciated. And if you've not read it, I would recommend it. He actually took the first stab at a sequel to a screw tape letters, mm. but he added a nice little touch where he put the angelic realm into the book as well, right? And so there's this father of this family and you see both the demonic and the angelic realm, how they are attempting uh, to both influence him. And I would, I would highly recommend that book. Here's, here's the issue that I, and I don't like saying this, but we are a culture right now that, that is attracted to darkness and will allow beings like nefarious to say things to us that you won't let people like Pastor McCoy say to you. And, but the other thing too is, right now I think we need some of the old time religion. I, I think, you know, everybody's, everybody's been accommodated enough, everybody's been nice enough. And, and I think, you know, I think people need some trips behind the woodshed to, to truly understand yeah, come on. What, what's going come on, on here. Sorry. Um, so, Chris, I know we were talking a little bit in the green room about this pendulum swinging back in Hollywood. And, uh, you know, I think we've seen, we saw Jesus Revolution, we see The Chosen, we see Nefarious, we see the numbers that sound a freedom pulled, you know, passing 100 million in the box office, beating out Indiana Jones. The audience wants it. Like we, we, like, we are fiending for good quality faith-driven content. And so we're seeing this pendulum kind of swing back. 
uh, it, you know, you being in the industry for a very long time, how do you feel about Hollywood and Christians taking back ground? And what's your vision for the future on how we can come together uh, collectively to be able to help each other? I think this is the most exciting time for us this is right now. What, what the Lord is doing, what's being built, the, the market, our industry maturing, the new things coming out. I, I mean, the vision that the Lord has given us is we want to build a studio and we want it for the Lord where he can be CEO. He can call the shots mm. and to win the culture through media for Christ. Not just fight it, win it. And so we're building, we're expanding. I mean, the, the Lord is opening doors in, in new ways. I mean, I'm seeing on our side with, with different production companies and entities, I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, probably surpassing a billion. I mean, it's, it's rising of what the Lord is opening up for this next wave of, about, of what's about to happen. And we are very, very excited to transition into that, more of that studio. And it, we don't have to be the only ones. I hope there's kingdom studios all throughout the U.S. I hope there's seven of them, a dozen of them, 20 of them. Because the need is great. And it doesn't even have to stay to the U.S. It can go all around the world. There's so, it is the Great Commission mm. to t have entertainment that, that edifies the human soul, that glorifies the Lord, that abides in his word, that abides in his spirit, that, that, that attacks the gates of hell, yeah, that attacks it. We must win the arts and entertainment mountain, and we're going to win it. And so I, I, we're more fired up than ever. The mm. doors are opening up. I mean, funding is coming through the door. I mean, there, there are things, I mean, uh, perhaps maybe a TV show for Mr. Mr. Dr. James here, uh, but many, many other things. Kids entertainment, how is, I asked, I have a big family. I'm one of eight kids, and I asked my family who has older kids, you know, my, my sisters-in-law, uh, my nieces and nephews go from like two to like graduated college. And I said, of all of you, what is the most trusted source of kids' entertainment that, what are the tr trusted sources of entertainment that you have for kids' entertainment? And they came back, not one. Mm. And I said, we got to save the kids. We got to protect the kids. We got to serve the kids. Come on. So That's we're great. fired up. I love it. Well, <laughs> I want to know about that. So you guys got a little something working. I know that you were... You know, there's talks of a, a sequel. Obviously, the ending kind of sets it up like that. And, you know, I really did appreciate at the end where it wasn't just this big, you know, altar call moment where he's like, I just profess Jesus. Like, it really does leave us My man. <laughs> wondering. I mean, being a filmmaker, it's, it's you know, it's uh, I'm making my first film right now. And we wanted to thread the needle. We wanted to cater to nonbelievers. We wanted to get them in the door. And I appreciated the cut on the trailer because... Uh, you know, you're, you're cutting together a trailer that's really appeasing uh, the non-believer side. You're setting bait and you're trying to get them in. And I think the more people we can get to see this film, uh, their lives are going to change. And what a shame that, uh, you know, it got rated R. I was, I was a little bit baffled on that. I know the execution scene, but I mean, I, I didn't think it deserved that rating. And I think that it was a, a disservice. And so clearly those guys at the MPI I heard you talk about it in an interview. They're just, it seems like they're godless and they're preventing our youth from showing up and watching this film. That's why I'm so stoked. I, I really encourage, we got a big section in the youth there. They came out, give it a round of applause for our youth. The high schoolers. They need to see this film. They need to see this can I, film. Can I add to that? Do it. The first screening we did of the film outside of our creative group is when you guys flew in and we showed it to our investors. Hmm. And that was last November. And one of our investors brought his uh, teenage grandson, grandkids with him and to the theater we had rented out. And these kids had a look on their face like, you know, they're on their way to Dickens' Bleak House, okay, you know? <laughs> And I mean, one of the, the one of the grandsons looks like a looked like a football player. He looked at me like, you know, when Beast Mode said at the Super Bowl a few years ago, I'm only here so I don't get fined. OK, <laughs> basically, they just look on their face like we showed up because mom told us grandpa will write us out of the out of the will <laughs> unless we come to see grandpa's cheesy Christian movie on a Saturday night. <laughs> All right. So we get in there. And, I mean, they, they had the whole Buffalo stance. They, they just could not have looked like they wanted to be anywhere else other than here, more obviously. We got to the end of the movie, and I went down to get everybody's reactions, and the first people I called on were them because mm. I wanted to see what they thought, and they were absolutely blown away. Mm -hmm. And one of them, and, and that same kid that looked like a football player, looked at us and said, I would take all of my unbelieving friends at school mm. to see this movie. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is not 
what I thought it was going yeah. to be, yeah. is what they said. That's good. Oh, I love it. Good. Jordan, I, being an actor, I, I'm curious. I know it's tough when you sign up to do a film like this. You're taking a risk, you know, I, and, and everybody in the film industry, we understand that. When you do certain types of film that are bold, you're taking a stance on life. You're taking the stance that we all should stand firm in. Have you been facing any backlash on that, and are you, are you prepared for it? Um, not yet. <laughs> uh, no, no, no backlash yet, but... But um, I don't know. I I think the film is significant, and I think the film is about something meaningful. And the remarkable thing, sort of to Steve's point, is that you know I have a lot of friends in the industry, and they are of a particular religious, pers non-religious persuasion or political persuasion. Mm. I, I have been surprised at how much they've loved the movie. Um, it's remarkable, actually. Mm. Um, so I don't know, because I think the film, the film transcends. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew that I wanted to be a part of something that was going to be significant, was going to be meaningful, was going to make people think. Mm. I, think it, I think it makes people think and reflect and, and is touching their lives. And that's sort of the purpose of art. Yeah. And I know that it's a, a one... One, one purpose of art, but one of the main purposes of what I do is to, is to touch people's lives, and I've had that opportunity through this movie, so, you know, I can only be grateful for how this came into my life, and what it's opened up um, for me personally that I would have never imagined. The people that are in my life because of this movie, and yeah. how I was taken care of by, this was not a normal movie set, mm. um, for a lot of reasons. I mean, I've never been on a set where um, I'm, are Elaine and um, Gabriel are they are they pastors are they ministers what do you what yes, yes? yes. <laughs> but, pastors or minister well anyway they were they were they were on set and they held a prayer every morning mm. before shooting yeah um, you didn't have to participate if if you didn't want but it was there and um, and as I was sharing the story of of, of Rocky being born, I mean, I, I went to bed the night before day one of shooting this movie, knowing that this movie lay before me and, and this whole endeavor, and, uh, and my wife had gone into to labor, and nobody knew. I hadn't really told anybody on the movie. Chris was general. Were you even aware? You knew. I told him that night. But I'll just share, this is very personal to me, but... Um, I think it's very meaningful to, to get to share with you guys is that um, Gabriel and, and Lorraine, these pastors that were, you know, on, on the movie, the night before I, I told them because the stakes couldn't have been higher for me, you know, personally and, and professionally in this way. Um, in terms of the, the justice I wanted to do to this movie and, and what I wanted to bring to it and all the rest. And they were there at, at my room that night and I told them, you know, what the situation was. And uh, as weird as it might sound to all of you, but I don't know that I've ever experienced in my life somebody looking at me in the eye and with total sincerity and, and, and utter conviction just tell me that they were going to pray for me. Mm. It was really moving. It was really significant to me. Um, and so I was, I was just touched in a, in a deep, deep, profound way. Um, by that simple act. Um, and so that was, that's just a small part of this whole world for me and this whole experience. Amen. Yeah, and even me being an actor, I did a lot of secular films, and I, and I booked a faith-based film, and it was just so relieving to work on a set where we did open the day out in prayer, submit the whole project to the Lord. And, and when you're casting a film, I mean, I'm sure you weren't trying to cast, you know, you're trying to cast all believers, and, and they didn't do that for my film, but everybody ended up being a believer on the film, which was just a coincidence. And so it was so, so moving to, to work on a project like that, to see the difference in environment and how people operate. Um, now, Chris, I, I would love for you to, to kind of your final thought on what do you want people to walk away from this film? We want to take action. We're obviously, we watched the film. We're all impacted by it. We all have this new perspective. But now it's like, what do we do next? And what do you hope that we can, we can do next? 
Yeah, that's a good question. And I'll just, I just want to say real quick to, to what he was talking about. Mm. For all of our movies, we have, we created a, a new department, and not that nobody else has done this, but it's important to us, is having a ministry team department mm. where it's full time, and we have it both on the evangelical Protestant side and on the Catholic side, because our crew had both. And so full time, they're there. That's what they're doing full time, is praying for people, all that sort of thing. So I think it makes a huge yeah. difference and is absolutely necessary. For what to do, or you know, what the impact of the movie, uh, you know, I mean, I've seen that this movie has really opened eyes. I mean, we've had testimonies. Steve has shared uh, with our team some of the, the testimonies that he's received where people's eyes are really being opened to, to the verse that was read earlier or, or the, about that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the, the rulers and the principalities and, and, and this, you know, the powers of darkness that to actually now have the, the eyes to see the distinction between Edward and, and Nefarious, mm -hmm. and, that, and that that is more common, right? That's, that's the world in which we live, to have the eyes to see, to love the person, but the, not the demonic influences that are, that are hounding them, and, 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 you know, the ones we love. And so, but from here, you know, I, I think uh, really being on the offense is, some, is, is, is what comes up for me. I mean, like, like I said, I mean, look, the, the gates of hell will not prevail is not that the gates are attacking us. Gates are for defense, right? And so the gates of hell will not prevail is that we're on offense and they will not prevail mm. against the, the name of Jesus. And so to, to me, it's, uh, it's something where I hope that the audience is galvanized to, be on, to go on offense mm. and to see the excellence that, the, you know, well, talking about the filmmaking for a second, the excellence of the acting, the excellence of the writing, the excellence of the, the, the production design and everything, and to, to go on offense, but then also just on a personal spiritual level to, to recognize the battle that we're in that James talks about at the end of the movie and to say, okay, we're getting involved and we're going on offense and we're going to make a difference. So mm. that to me is what I hope the audience has taken away from it. Amen. Amen. And uh, yeah, we can clap for that. And Steve, we'll just, we'll just end the, the Q&A on this. You know, I, I'm glad that you brought up that line and I wrote it down when I saw it again. I love that line that says, I didn't know I was in the fight and, and that is why we are losing because we don't recognize we're in the fight. We can't recognize every single day that, you know, we're, we're, at a, we're in war. So how can we equip ourselves as Christians? What are some, some big points that you can hit on and say, hey, this is how you equip yourself just because you have dove into this theme so deep, deeper than most of us will ever go, what are some things that you can tell us on how we can be better equipped? I think on an institutional level, the, the church institutionally has to take discipleship more seriously than mm. conversion, because yeah. otherwise you just end up with a bunch of false converts. We're not called to make converts, we're called to make disciples. And a lot of our people, frankly, are not equipped for the challenges that they are facing uh, in this culture as believers that will only become more cumbersome, that will only become more confrontational. So if there are pastors in this room, I, I would just encourage you and encourage your brethren that we must make disciples. We must equip Amen. the saints. That is, our, that is your calling. Amen. For the, and I, I think for those of us that are just believers, that are laymen, is to, is to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, don't, you're not nicer than God. That's idolatry. Stop it. Okay? Don't be nicer than God. You can't love anybody more than Jesus loved them. And he confronted people all the time. He confronted error all the time. He confronts it still in the, by his spirit. He confronts it in us. Right? And so a, a willingness to, to be confrontational to, uh, to put the truth back in with the truth and grace. Uh, the New Testament says, for the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And I think that grace and that truth together, putting those two things back together as a combination again. And, and here's the irony. By removing truth from the grace, there's a lot of women in our churches who had abortions when they heard those lies of Planned Parenthood when they were younger. Mm -hmm. and, and since they've not been confronted, they also, by the way, haven't been made whole so you're not being nice by, by letting them just sit there and simmer in their sins. Jesus went to the cross despising the shame. He hated what, what sin did to us, mm. right? And so they need that deliverance. They need that 
uh, they need that redemption. They need to be made whole so that they are then now turned loose to go out, and, go out and find the next generation of young women before they fall for those lies. That's just one example. Is that this, when we, by removing truth from grace, we are not offering real grace. We're offering accommodation. And so a lot of people are still sitting there dying in their sins, simmering in their sins, unforgiven and, and unwhole in their sins. That's not the gospel. I, that might be marketing. That might be profitable, but it is not prophetic. And we have to get back to being that again. Amen. We're so grateful that you guys came out. Uh, the Lord just put on my heart to pray for you guys because you guys are warriors and you're going to continue to be fighting that good fight. So I'm going to pray this out, guys. If you guys want to just extend your hands so we can pray over them. <sighs> Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray for my brothers up here. I just ask that you can continue to use them in a mighty way to glorify your name through the arts, Lord, through the medium of film and television and through publishing books, Lord. We're so blessed by how you called Steve to write this book and for the filmmakers to understand the power in this story and, and the power of the spiritual realm, Lord. I just ask that you can continue to guide his steps as he is brainstorming new ways to be able to point people in the direction of you, to be able to expose the lies of the enemy, to be able to expose evil. Lord, I ask a special blessing over Jordan and uh, Lord Chris as they continue to um, just do good work in Hollywood, Lord. I just ask that you can, Lord, assemble a team in Hollywood where we can continue to make high-quality, faith-driven films, Lord, that can plant well-watered, fruitful trees of life within our society and that you can continue to push that pendulum back in your direction and away from the enemy's direction. Lord, guide our steps. I pray for each and every individual that is here right now in this building to be protected from the enemy. Lord, I ask that if there's anybody struggling with anything spiritually or they know somebody, Lord, that you can give them peace and that you can remind them that your word will renew their mind and will heal them in the name of Jesus. And I pray that as we continue to operate as Christians, that we can be more bold, more courageous. Lord, we're, we just went through the book of Acts in our anchored reading, and we're just so inspired by those early church founders and, and the boldness that Paul and all those guys had. Lord, give us that boldness. Lord, do not give us a, a, a spirit of fear, Lord, but a, a, a power, love, and a sound mind and just give us that courage. We give tonight to you. We're so thankful for what you just did tonight. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.